Thank you very much, Dr. O'Donnell. I have to say this is the first time I've been cheered for giving a talk on gender ideology. <laughs> this is not the usual reaction. But I'm delighted to be here and I'm grateful to Dr. O'Donnell for inviting me here to talk about this issue. Now usually I use slides um, for this talk. It just seemed, given the, the setup, it was probably better not to. But I invite you to go to our website, personidentity.com. There's plenty of additional information there. But I want to talk to you about this issue for a number of reasons. One, when, when I first started talking about this, probably five, six years ago, I used to go and give a talk. And afterwards, people always come up and, and talk to you. And people would come and say, you know, my hairdresser's nephew is transgender. Now when I go and give talks, and in the past year, even with COVID, I gave probably 50 talks on this topic. Every place I go, people come up to me afterwards and say, my son has come out as transgender, my daughter, my brother, my sister, even in good Catholic groups. So here's what we need to know about this. Because the transgender issue is such a cultural tsunami that has hit not just our culture, but much of the developed world with such force, it is affecting all of us. It's not only affecting just the people who become confused about their identity, it's affecting all of us. And so I want to put out some ideas tonight um, by telling you first about a a person I've gotten to know, but I want you to take to heart two things. That remember, in dealing with this issue, there's a lot of pain around it. There's pain for siblings, for parents, for the individuals who are struggling with identity. There's pain even when those families have chosen to support someone's transition, and they're sort of all gung-ho and all aboard. But in fact, you get them alone, there's a lot of pain because there's loss. One of the things that happens, given our culture and the celebration that the idea that people can just self-define their identity and that when they come out, they should be greeted with only one kind of reaction, affirmation, celebration, approval. Even those families that have been swept up and are sort of supporting it will say that there's loss. Because, for example, as a mother, you give birth to a child, you gave birth to a son. 15 years later, he says, I'm your daughter. And he wants you to erase family history. There are even companies now that will doctor your family photos in order to change the reality of someone's childhood. So this phenomenon causes rupture, causes disruption, causes pain and alienation. But there's good news that in the midst of this pain and hunger, people are searching for meaning. They want to know who they are. That's the most fundamental thing about each one of us. Every one of us has to figure out who we are most fundamentally. Because unless we know who we are, we can't begin to answer the other important questions in life. Questions like, what's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of my life? Why am I here? How should I live? What's good? What's evil? How do I make it through suffering that doesn't seem to make sense? The only way to answer those questions is to really know who you are, to take to heart the fact that we are sons or daughters of the Lord, constantly from the first moment of our existence in relationship with God. That changes everything. But let me share with you some uh, perspectives that come from a different place. So I want to tell you about a uh, an evolutionary biologist I've come to know through Twitter and, and through working on these issues. His name is Colin Wright. 
And he's a left-leaning evolutionary biologist, and he's a self-professed atheist. He's also a strong defender of the biological reality of sexual difference. That is, the fact that the human person is, and always has been, only either male or female. Now, being a defender of the sex binary, the fact of being male or female, was virtually unheard of 50 years ago. It wasn't necessary. Male and female, he created them. It's a truth revealed by scripture, but it's also built into who we are. It's an observable fact of nature, of our relationships. And it was universally accepted until fairly recently. In 2018, as a newly minted PhD, Colin Wright began a postdoc research fellowship at Penn State. 2018, it's not that long ago, the two, uh, transgender tsunami was really ravaging the culture. It was drowning out reasonable debate. It was erasing scientific facts from public view. To a scientist like Colin, these developments were alarming. So he began to write about gender ideology, about the reality of biological sex. He began to write and critique what he saw happening in the culture. The erasure of truth and the putting forth of a public narrative that came with strings attached, that people had to accept or they would be canceled or, or lose their job. The public narrative around identity is based on the nebulous concept of gender identity. And that phrase, gender identity, which I'll unpack in a few minutes, effectively displaced scientific facts about the reality of sex and the nature of the human person. So in February of 2020, Wright and a fellow biologist from the University of Manchester in the UK, Emma Hilton, plunged headlong into the transgender waters. They wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal. It was titled, The Dangerous Denial of Sex. In this article, they warned of an unscientific trend that was leading towards the outright denial of the reality of biological sex. And they cited as evidence of this trend a number of pro high profile articles that had been written that aim to cast doubt on the idea that we're male and female. They aim to suggest that sex was really a spectrum, that it was simplistic, it was unsophisticated, it was old school to talk about sex as male or female. Well, Wright and Hilton in their Wall Street Journal article debunked gender ideology's absurd claim. And that claim was this, that everyone, regardless of genetics or anatomy, should be free to choose their identity, whether male, female, both, neither, something else. That's the narrative. That claim, that's the core claim of gender ideology, that every person has the right to self-define. They characterized this line of reasoning as having no basis in reality. You can imagine what their Twitter feeds looked like after that. And in fact, they called it an egregious understatement to even suggest that this claim that a person can self-define who they are, regardless of biological sex, they said it was false at every conceivable scale. That's the claim that ended Colin Wright's academic career. I have more to tell you about that, but first let me give you some necessary context for those who might be less familiar with gender ideology. Gender ideology is today a sacred belief. It's kind of a quasi-religion. It's a worldview with its own terminology. And in fact, that's one of the things that I've seen over the years as school districts, for example, adopt gender ideology, which really started about a decade ago. They brought in anti-bullying programs 
Now, nobody wants any child to be bullied. We can all agree on that. But the way to deal with bullying doesn't require an entire new vocabulary. It doesn't require teacher training about the nature of the person, debunking the idea of human nature. But that's how it starts. So it has its own vocabulary. It came in as anti-bullying. And the theory was, the justification was, that in order for kids who identified in ways different from others, or who experienced same-sex sexual attraction or, or other desires, to feel safe and to feel comfortable, everybody needed to learn the terminology. Everybody needed to affirm and to celebrate these identities. And the teachers were taught that every person in the classroom should be presumed to be potentially LGBTQ on and on, but in particular, transgender. Once you make that assumption, once you change your thinking to say something that previously was unthinkable, is thinkable, and you present it that way to students to imagine themselves as transgender, you have shifted, you have shifted the basis of their stability. You've uprooted it, really. So gender ideology has its own terminology, has its own rituals. And we see this with the, the progression of transition. We see it with the language. We see it with the, uh, the group rituals, oftentimes centered around online communities. They have rituals. They're almost religious in nature. There are sins as well, the sins of transphobia the sins of making assumptions and judgments. So gender identity is an invented term. You'll see it in psychological manuals, but it's an invented term. And here's what it means. It just means a person's feelings. Their feelings about how they identify. It's nothing more complicated than that. In fact, the Human Rights Campaign's Coming Out Guide describes gender identity as a person's perception of self. Self-perception. We have all sorts of self-perceptions. We can perceive of ourselves as thin. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. We don't require other people to confirm or validate your self-perception about your weight, or your height, or your brilliance, or your hairstyle, or anything else. Only your, quote, gender identity, your self-perception of who you claim to be. But gender identity can't be measured. It can't be assessed. It can't be imaged. It can't be tested for. And in fact, it can't even be known by someone other than the person who declares that gender identity. So how do you know what someone's gender identity is? You have to ask. And that's why we have this hyper-focus in our culture on finding out people's pronouns, asking people's names every time. Why? Because this feeling of who you are could change. It could change from today to tomorrow. It could change from this moment to the next. So there's a sense of always having to ask, what is that person's self-perception? What do I need to do to validate that? So these identity feelings are inherently subjective, variable, and yet they have a power of their own. According to gender ideology, gender identity feelings actually define the person, regardless of the person's sexed body. So gender identity, we're told, is the most significant aspect of a person the most significant, regardless of your sex body, regardless of where you came from, regardless of anything else. It's your inner feelings, your self-perception, at least according to this belief system. You know, several years ago, I visited Georgetown uh, University during coming out week by design. I was not coming out, but I was visiting. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a highly visible celebration of all genders and sexualities. So I noticed many students were wearing these brightly colored t-shirts of all different colors. I'm sure it represented the rainbow when they all got together. But emblazoned on these t-shirts 
was the slogan, no assumptions, no judgments. And so I asked several of the, of the students at different times in different places what they meant by this slogan. And the replies were all the same. They affirmed this idea, the fluid principle of self-definition, that I get to decide who I am, and that I must declare who I am. So the rest of you can make no assumptions about who I am. Someone might appear to be a male, don't assume. They might appear to be female, don't assume. You know nothing, no assumptions. But the second part of that, no judgments. Deep into this ideology is the idea that what we do with our bodies, how we express our sexuality, has no objective truth to it. That anything I decide, as long as it's freely decided, is a good thing. So therefore, when we're confronted with a range of sexualities and, quote, gender identities, the good person has no assumptions and no judgments. That's gender ideology. That's the power of gender ideology. So I promised I'd return to uh, my friend's travails, Colin's travails, but one more digression, a bit of history. So many Catholics and Christians hear the word gender and they think it's a synonym for male and female. So I want to challenge that notion because many good people believe that they're affirming something true about who we are when they say, no, 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 two genders, male and female. So the better way to understand gender is not as this idea of male, a stand-in for male and female, but rather to realize it was conceived in iniquity at least the modern usage as it was applied to persons. When I was growing up, people were very comfortable talking about sex, sexual difference, male, female, using the word gender. That was a colloquial use. But here's the real origin here. Um, and, and the reason I tell you this is because one of the ways that we get ourselves out of the mess that we find ourselves in today is by using language to mean the truth, to use words to capture reality. So we have to know what words mean. And that's a challenge today, because one of the things that ideologues, the gender ideologues are doing, is constantly changing the definitions of words. And so I read literature constantly coming out in the medical literature, the psychological literature. And it's almost like a standard apology now in these academic, peer-reviewed journal articles, they will say things like, the, the terminology is always changing, and there's a built-in apology in case anyone's offended at the use of certain terms. But they're redefining reality as they redefine language. So what should we know about gender identity? Well, the term was actually um, or gained currency in the 60s, but it's really the sort of the thought product of a guy named Dr. John Money, who in the 1950s uh, was working with two different populations. He was working with people who had what was called disorders of sexual development. In other words, when they were developing inside their mother's uterus, something went wrong in their sexual development. So you had an aberration in terms of their bodily reality. Sometimes it was ambiguous, sometimes it was something that could be repaired, but he was dealing with a, a population that had difficulties in that area. The other population he was dealing with were people who identified as transsexual, that was the word back then. It was mostly adult males, middle-aged, who decided that they wanted surgical transition, partly because the surgical transition became available but it really grew out of kind of a, a sexualized desire to see themselves, to experience themselves as women. So Dr. Money, who called himself, he was a psychologist, but called himself a sexologist, and ironically had a very strict upbringing in, in some Protestant denomination, rejected it all, became you know, an ardent proponent of the sexual revolution to the point that later in life he even was very open towards adult child sex 
possibly being beneficial. Yes, that's the Dr. Money who conceived the term gender and gender identity. So his work in the 50s and then the 60s made him theorize this. He believed that it was possible for a human being to have a social identity completely at odds with their bodily reality. That was his theory, that social identity was more a matter of, for example, nurture rather than nature. That children were more like blank, blank slates. It's how you raise them, how you treat them. This was just a theory until the early 60s. And there was a couple who had twin boys. And during the circumcision of those boys, one of the babies suffered a tragic accident. They used a laser or something and just obliterated his penis. So the parents, of course, were distraught. Here they have two boys, one of whom just has a destroyed genitalia, and they're wondering, oh my gosh, what do we do about this? The mom saw Dr. Money expressing his theory that what mattered most in determining who you are was how you were raised, the affirmation you would get from those around you. So the mom called. Imagine how desperate she felt. She called him, and she explained the problem. And he was at Hopkins at the time, Johns Hopkins. And he said, we can help you. Bring the child in. And so he was not a surgeon. There were surgeons who worked with him. But basically, his assurance to the parents was this. We can fix the anatomical issue. What's important here is that you raise this child as a girl, and he will be a girl. Call him a girl's name, treat him like a girl. He will be a girl. And so the parents did. They raised their, their twin boys as one boy and one girl, and they called you know, the little boy who'd had the, the um, disaster, called him a girl's name, tried to dress him in dresses and, and all these things. And yet, the child knew it was not right. But during those first five years, when, he was, when the children were under Dr. Money's care, he saw them on a regular basis. And it came out later that the, both boys accused him of engaging in, in uh, child abuse, basically making them simulate intercourse and things like that. He had a theory that he was imprinting that on the children. But after five years, Dr. Money declared his experiment a success. And so he went on the road. He was writing papers telling people, this proves my theory is true. That what matters most is how a person identifies, how they're perceived by those around them, how they're affirmed, how they know themselves to be from external validation. It just wasn't true. By the time these kids were early teenagers, the child whose identity had been sort of changed to be feminine was so miserable, his parents finally broke down and told him and shared with him the story of his birth and the accident and what had happened. And he immediately embraced that male identity. He ended up later having some sort of reconstructive surgery. But he chose a new name. He called himself David. He, he acted like a, a male, and, and he embraced that. But the trauma of having lived a decade where people were treating him one way, when everything in him biologically was oriented towards his true identity as a male, took its toll, and most likely probably the abuse as well. So he committed suicide as a young man. His brother also died an early tragic death. What of Dr. Money? Dr. Money never recanted his claims of success, that gender is something that is just sort of your social identity and, and what matters is how you present and what's affirmed. But that concept, gender, grew legs and it, it went into academia. Radical feminists loved it. And by radical feminists here, I'm not talking about feminists who were uh, working to ensure that women could have an education, could hold a job, could have a bank account in their names. 
but radical Marxist feminists. There was one in particular named Shulamith Firestone, and she wrote a book called The Dialectic of Sex. And as a Marxist, she looked at the relationships between the sexes much like Marx looked at the relationships between the classes. But she said for women, oppression came not just from capitalism, not just from patriarchy, but oppression came from family, from childbearing, from reproduction, from sexual difference, from women's very bodies. And that women would be freed only when they were relieved of this burden of carrying children. To the radical feminists, having this idea that gender, your social identity, could exist apart from the reality of your biological sex was tremendously appealing. One slogan that was common during that time was, biology is not destiny. Again, the idea that I am who I want to be. I get to decide who I am. So this idea of gender went into academia. It was feminism, went into academia. Gender theory later was morphed and, and changed more by queer theory. And now we have gender ideology. So from the beginning, this concept of gender was designed to express a divide, not the truth about the human person. The truth about the human person is we're a unity of body and soul. It's impossible for me to conceive of being me apart from the fact that I'm a female. My relationships, everything, that's who I am. But this idea of gender now has morphed into an idea that, that says gender identity, who I am, is who I decide I am. I get to, de to self-define my very existence. So the concept of gender is a problematic one. It's one we hear all everywhere now. Gender ideologues reject the very idea of human nature, of the natural order. Now in saying this, I want to be real careful here because there are many good people, people who are Christians, people who are Catholics, who have embraced various parts of gender ideology because they do not see its inherent incompatibility with Christian anthropology, with a Christian understanding of who we are. They don't see that. Why? Because gender ideology is like a giant fog machine in our culture. You know, it just puts these narratives out there and this new language and, and then it's got the, uh, the, uh, the weight of, of, of force and, and compulsion, shame, cancel culture, losing your job, being a bigot. People don't question very deeply. So what should we understand here? Gender ideology, gender identity ideology is utterly incompatible with the truth about the human person. From where I sit as a lawyer, gender identity is also completely unworkable as a legal concept, although it's out there. Why? Because it's completely subjective. It can change. Feelings change. Feelings change all the time. It's fluid. You can't know it from the outside. How do you have a law where you're going to penalize someone for discriminating on the basis of gender identity when there's no way to know what someone's gender identity is in that moment unless it's declared? And then there's that element of compulsion requiring people to go along with it. And in fact, we see this not just here in the US but across the globe. Indeed, in about a month and a half ago, the United Nations independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity. Did you know we're paying for that, by the way, since the US is one of the major funders as part of the, uh, the Human Rights Council. But this independent expert has been doing a number of reports, and he released a two-part report on gender theory. Anyone who's interested in it and really wants to understand the other side should read these reports. But here's what he says. He says, with the weight of the United Nations, so he's presenting this to the General Assembly and, and kind of fixes in to push it through, or at least to operate as if this were international law. It has not been embraced officially in international law. But he concludes this. He said, the right 
to self-determine one's gender is a fundamental part of a person's freedom. It's a cornerstone of a person's identity. What did he contrast it with? Rigid understandings of the male-female binary, which he attributed to being an oppressive relic of colonialism. And that's a theory, if you start reading this and you really get into it in the literature, actually, you'll see it even in kids' books, the claim that the idea that we are male and female was simply imposed by Christian missionaries upon native cultures who had a more fluid understanding of who we are. It's not true, but that's part of the narrative. So let's get back to science here and to our, to our honest biologist, Colin Wright. So he and, and Emma Hilton closed their, uh, their Wall Street Journal article with a call to action. And they said, it's time for scientists to stand up to the empirical reality, stand up for the empirical reality of biological sex. And so in their article, in very brief fashion, you can find the article, The Dangerous Denial of Sex, they laid out the incontestable scientific facts, clearly and briefly. They said, in humans, as in most animals and plants, an organism's biological sex corresponds to one of two distinct types of reproductive anatomy that is developed in order to produce small or large sex cells, sperm or eggs, and is associated with the biological functions in sexual reproduction. In humans, they continued, reproductive anatomy is unambiguously male or female 99.98% of the time. Put simply, there are two types of bodies, male and female, and they're designed for reproduction. Reproduction occurs with sperm and egg. There is no person on the planet ever who is conceived other than by the joinder of sperm and egg, male and female, the sex binary. So anyone who tells you that there are more than two sexes is just making it up. What often happens is people will say, well, what about people who, have, who are intersex condition? What about people who have those situations? Doesn't that disprove the idea of a sex binary? And that was something these two biologists addressed as well. They said, no, there are all sorts of developmental variations. There are some people, when I was, when I was young, uh, there were some kids I remember in my grade school class who were born with short arms because their mothers took thalidomide, which was a drug that was given for a while to decrease the risk of miscarriage and morning sickness. They didn't know what the risks were. So some of these children were born with these abnormally short limbs. They were not a new kind of human being destined to have short limbs. That was a developmental disorder. In the same way, when a child is being formed in utero, sometimes things go wrong in terms of sexual development. Something can go wrong in terms of hormones, in terms of the reproductive organs, the genitalia, even the chromosomes. But that does not negate the fact that what you have is a disorder of male sexual development or female sexual development. So these two, these two scientists put it bluntly. There is no third type of sex cell, sex is binary. Sex is binary. It can't change. That's biology. So now pause for a second and just consider what was at stake for these two scientists in making what should be an ordinary indisputable claim. In other words, this is, this is without a doubt true across science. You can prove it. So they're making this claim, not in some uh, journal for academics, but in mainstream media. Consider what was at stake early 2020 when they wrote this article. Cancel culture was flexing its muscles. The woke mobs were skillfully weaponizing social media to badger, boycott, and bully employers into firing people, and that still is happening today. The culture was trying to silence truth tellers. Why do I point that out? Because every person in this room is called to be a truth teller. 
Every one of you will face moments when you have to decide, am I going to speak the truth even when there's a cost? Particularly about something so foundational to the truth, so foundational to human flourishing as what it means to be a human person, the reality of male and female. So speaking out meant putting a target on their backs. And to their credit, both biologists saw it as a risk worth taking. Remember, they're not religious people. But they were motivated, one, out of concern for scientific integrity, but also, as they explained in the journal article, they were motivated by the concern of the harm that was being done. And they listed several vulnerable populations. They said it raises this promotion of gender identity, this idea that you can self-define who you are, creates serious human rights uh, concerns for vulnerable, vulnerable groups, including women, homosexuals, and children. Now, I want to take each in turn because they're instructive. They pointed out, for example, that sex-based rights for women ensure female safety. You know, for a number of years, I taught um, in a, an international development program at Catholic U, um, helping people who were going to go back to their home countries in Africa and parts of Asia, Latin America, um, you know, work within the development field. And one of the things that became clear, especially in talking with people who were from, let's say, parts of Africa, was that one of the key reasons girls dropped out of school was because they could not go safely to the bathroom. If there were no safe restrooms, girls were vulnerable to attack, to sexual assault. If there was no privacy to take care of their female cycle, they would not go to school. And so that was one of the basic things that development and development organizations sought to secure in these these developing areas of the world where women's rights were not protected. But they knew that if they could ensure girls' safety by giving them private, sex-segregated spaces where no males were allowed, these girls would stay in school. They would learn, they would be educated. They wouldn't be dropping out as soon as they hit puberty. And yet here, here we are in this culture. It's considered impolite, or worse, transphobic, to even discuss the fact that it's dangerous for females to have restrooms open to anyone who identifies as a male. And indeed, I, I live close to Loudoun County. Some of you may have heard about the situation there where there were several sexual assaults in the school. The first one occurred when a young man who was troubled, clearly troubled, he identified as pansexual, not transgender. He was just kind of all over the map. He, had a, he was from a troubled background. But he went to school wearing a skirt. And this apparently was something fairly ordinary for him. Everyone knew he was sort of trying to figure himself out. But he went to school wearing female attire. And he could go in the girls' restroom, unchallenged. Because under a gender identity regime, one that says it's discriminatory to make an assumption that someone who looks like a male is really a male and shouldn't belong in the female restroom, under a gender identity regime, teachers and adults will not challenge a young man wearing a skirt who walks into a female restroom. No one will challenge that person. In this case, that particular young man turned out to be a predator. It doesn't, even if he weren't, you would have the same problem because any male could do the very same thing. They didn't even need to wear a skirt because one of the, the gospel truths of gender identity ideology is you self-define your identity, you declare it, but you don't have to transition. You don't have to change your appearance. If you do, great, wonderful, but you don't have to. So I could stand here right now in this moment and say, I identify as a male. 
Gender identity ideology says you have to embrace that, you have to affirm that, you have to accept that. In spite of everything your senses tell you, in spite of the fact that somewhere down deep you're saying, that's not true. So one of the problems here, when we have laws, as we do in Virginia, at least on the K through 12 uh, level, that say that anyone who identifies, or that, or that people's ac student access to facilities, bathrooms, locker rooms, et cetera, is determined solely on the basis of gender identity. One of the problems when you do that is that you're sending a message to every female. And the message is this, your safety doesn't matter. Your feelings don't matter. And not only that, don't pay attention to that uncomfortable feeling. Don't trust your gut that tells you there's something wrong when a six foot three male walks into the restroom and you're supposed to pretend this is all normal. Don't trust your gut. What's the matter with you? Are you transphobic? That is the narrative. And I can tell you that for certain because in talking with people who have been, quote, detransitioners, in other words, they've been on both sides of it, particularly young women who became confused about their identity, they started, quote, transitioning, changing their hair, maybe they took hormones and surgery, and then they lived as a male, represented themselves as a male, and then realized, you know what, I'm still a female. This isn't working. This is hurting me. And they detransition. They will tell you of the persecution, even within those LGBT circles, for anyone who doubts gender ideology, anyone who dares to question, anyone who raises a concern. That's the reality. So the message is, and this is one of the things that these two biologists raised, is that it's not safe for females. Biology matters. Biology matters. We need to have the courage to say so. They also talked about sex-based rights for females in terms of Title IX. The opportunities that came, particularly for women, when the law protected and made room and made space for and guaranteed females' rights, that the benefit for, for girls was tremendous. The number of girls who participated in, in athletics skyrocketed after Title IX. You know, and, and I remember what it was like before Title IX. I was in high school, actually, when it was passed, but it, Catholic school didn't pay attention to it. It took a while for things to, to sort of trickle down. But in high school, I was one of Indiana's best female runners in high school. So I ran with the girls track team, but I wanted to run cross country. There was no girls cross country team. So I got permission to run with the, with the boys team. So here I was, a senior, well-conditioned, top female athlete in the state. You know who I ran with? The two slowest guys on the team. They were freshmen, and they could not wait to be able to beat me. And by the end of the season, indeed, they did. Because the differences between males and females as athletes, even at the top level, are significant. And so when you erase that, and you say, people can play sports according to however they identify, what you're effectively doing is turning sports into co-ed teams, which is fine if you want to have co-ed teams, but let's not pretend that we're still giving females the same opportunity. We're just not. What else should, did these um, two biologists raise? Well, they're both political progressives, so they spoke about another group that they felt was being harmed by gender identity ideology. They support same-sex relationships, which we know is immoral, and there are just lots of problems with that. But here's what I want to put out to you. They warned of the dangers to people, particularly girls, who were same-sex attracted. Because transgender ideology being what it is, these women, these young girls were being bullied, threatened by transgender identified, quote, women, males, 
males who identified as women and then used that to leverage themselves to say to these same-sex attracted women, see, what's the matter with you? Why aren't you going to date me? Why aren't you going to have sex with me? So it's ironic that the same-sex attracted community has been one of the strongest voices in favor of recognizing the reality of sexual difference. Particularly, and, and I've worked with a number of these women um, who identify as lesbian. I mean, they're outspoken. They say, we know what sex is. And a guy wearing a dress is not it. You know, so it's ironic. But at any rate, these two biologists raise that. Why? Because there's a danger factor for these women. What else did they talk about? Perhaps most importantly, they raise the issue that children are most vulnerable to a culture that engages in sex denialism. And that was their, their phrase. And here's the reality today. In schools, on social media, in peer groups, our children, our teens, our young people, your peers, are being taught that identity is determined by feelings. How do they know who they are? Well, think about stereotypes. Where do you fit in? You know, when I was growing up, uh, again, sort of in the feminist era, people told my parents and, and that generation not to box your kids into stereotypes. If you have a girl, don't make her wear pink, don't make her wear a dress, let her be who she wants to be. But no one ever suggested we were not females, even if we didn't like to wear dresses. But today, we're seeing the opposite. What we're seeing is a culture that is telling young people themselves, first of all, that it's their burden, it's their job to figure out who they really are, throwing into question things that are not up for questioning, the basic reality of whether you're male or female. And it says, how do you know if you're male or female, if you're transgender? Well, where do you feel most comfortable? What kinds of things do you like to do? If it's a little kid, what kind of toys do you like to play with? In other words, look at the stereotypes. See which stereotypes you fit most closely with. And that will define who you are. It's completely backwards, completely upends decades of trying to get away from putting people in, in little boxes while respecting the fundamental truth of who they are. It was less than a decade ago that the Bible of mental health diagnoses, the DSM, still categorized the experience of a person who rejected their sexual identity as male or female as a mental health issue, a mental health disorder. It was called gender identity disorder. That diagnosis disappeared from the DSM in 2013 not because there was new research, not because people who suffered from this, this disconnect or this deep sense of fragmentation between their, their felt identity and the reality of their body, not because they suddenly became healthy and this was understood as a way to be a flourishing human being, not at all. When you read the accounts of the proceedings that went, or that occurred when the APA decided to change the DSM, they admit it was a political move. It was a political move to destigmatize the idea of being transgender. And that was an, an idea that was lobbied for by a small number of males who identified as transgender since the early 1990s. They even came up with a bill, an international bill of gender human rights in 1996 that's very much like what the UN puts forth today, says that every person has the right to self-define who they are. Every person can have any sexual relationship they desire. Doesn't matter what their body is, doesn't matter how they identify. And that every person gets to modify their body however they choose in order to express this personal identity. So that was an ideological conviction back in the 1990s. It took a couple of decades 
until they were able to push that through with the APA change. But the reality is, people who are struggling with identity issues are people who are in pain, people who have real wounds, people who need a solution. They don't need transition, which solves nothing. When you look at the population of people who are experience identity issues, the percentage varies according to the study, but, but it's well accepted. It's, Upwards of three quarters in one study was as high as 88% of them have serious depression, anxiety. The number who have are on the autism spectrum is anywhere from two to four times higher. The number who come from adoptive backgrounds, which are often characterized by instability and maybe foster care for a number of years, is twice as high among those who identify as transgender. Those who have had uh, traumatic childhoods, attachment disorders in childhood, who suffered adverse childhood events. Those are the kinds of situations that lead to someone feeling these tremendous conflicts. And in the past, the mental health professionals had a way to help people who were experiencing that with therapy to help them integrate their sense of who they are, to find healing for those underlying wounds, to experience love and dignity as they are. But all of that gets thrown out in a culture that has embraced gender identity ideology, where it says, ah, you're identifying as something different from uh, the reality of your body? Great, we're here for you, we'll affirm you. Can I drive you to the gender clinic? Can I pay for it? Any person who's 18 or over can walk into a Planned Parenthood and request cross-sex hormones. So initially there was a lot of talk about how the psychological community was going to help and screen and help ensure that someone who was experiencing this really was, quote, trans. That's all gone by the wayside. Why? Because we have a profit-driven medical system. There's money to be made. There's a lot of money being made. So the protocol now for people who are experiencing identity confusion for children is that when a child is pre-pubertal, they don't, they're not given any hormones, but they're encouraged to socially transition. Social transition sounds kind of benign, right? Social, that's a good thing. Transition, eh, maybe. What does it mean? It means you change your hair, you change your clothes, maybe your name, your pronouns. Still sounds kind of benign. It's not. It's a psychosocial transition. What you're doing is having someone present themselves as they are not, and having other people relate to them as they are not. And so it forms in them a conviction that's erroneous about who they are. Imagine, I have seven kids, imagine if I picked out one of my kids and for a whole year called them stupid. People would tell me I'm a terrible mother, and I would be. Why? Because the, that would inevitably affect how he saw himself, whether he was stupid or not. You know, imagine a little boy who's confused about his identity, and he expresses that to his parents, and they say, great, Patrick, we'll call you Priscilla. And they start dressing him in, in a dress and they change his hair and they tell everyone, isn't this wonderful, he's figured out who he is. And they're reinforcing and reinforcing. Well, the research shows it's very hard for a child who's undergone this psychosocial transition to backtrack, as it would be for you and for me. Any one of us in that position how hard is it to, to change your mind publicly about something you've committed to? Imagine being a kid, and all your friends only know you as Susie, but really you're Sam. And then, what happens when puberty starts to get closer? Well, it's a source of tremendous anxiety for these kids. Why? Because if you've been presenting yourself in a way that's different from the truth about who you are, the idea of puberty is terrifying. Imagine if you're little Sarah, who's really Sam, 
and Sam has been presenting himself as Sarah. And all of a sudden, he's inching closer to puberty. And he realizes, as he watches his friends, my voice is going to drop. I'm going to get that peach fuzz. People are going to know I'm not really a girl. So what has the uh, compliant medical community done? They've solved that problem. Not by questioning the erroneous premise that a person can ever change sex, you can't, or that someone's healthier presenting themselves as a sort of a, a desired identity. Instead, they say, we've got a solution for that. We'll put you on puberty blockers. We'll freeze frame you right there, ostensibly so the, the child can sort of have extra time to figure it out. But really, the reason for doing that is because adults who identified as transgender made the argument that their lives would have been so much easier if when they were kids, they hadn't gone through puberty. They wouldn't have needed to have a tracheal shave to cut off the Adam's apple. They could have just presented looking more like a female. So it's driven by adults who are looking back at their own past and saying, we've got a better idea about how someone else's kid should be treated. And so that's been the driving force behind these puberty blockers. But here's the reality with these puberty blockers. They were first billed as being reversible. You put them on, you're freeze framed, you stop taking them, everything resumes. No problem. Not true. Why? Because when puberty is supposed to occur, it's not a, just a genital phenomenon. It's not just about whiskers. It's about your whole self. It's about your brain. It's about your social development. It's about your genitals and your reproductive organs. It helps you mature sexually. It's about that rush of hormones. It's a whole body experience. And so to put a child on puberty blockers because the adults in the room want to perpetuate the possibility that this child is going to go on and, quote, be transgender is really a form of child abuse. And here's the additional factor. Between 97 and 100% of kids who are on puberty blockers go on to cross-sex hormones. You can understand why. Here they are. They're sort of frozen in time, right, pre-pubertal, as all their friends are going through puberty, and they still look like the scrawny 10-year-old. No one can tell what their real sex is because they have that androgynous look, but they're clearly not going through puberty with all their friends. And so they want to go through puberty. And what that does is it accelerates the push to go on cross-sex hormones. Well, here's the truth. If you were on puberty blockers before puberty, guess what? Your reproductive organs and your genitals do not mature. Your sexual function is never going to be what it should be. Your ability to have a child is not going to be there. Because once you take the cross-sex hormones, once you add that to the medical regime of a child who's on puberty blockers and has never gone through natural puberty, that child is sterilized for life. So we're talking 12, 13, 14-year-old kids who, because when they were a little kid, they said, mommy, I'm really a whatever, the opposite sex, or I'm non-binary, or, or whatever they learned at school, or saw in their peer groups, or even in cartoons. But the adults in the room are saying, this is a great way to go, because we can help them be functioning, quote, transgender adults. The reality is not pretty. So these kids, if they go from puberty blockers to cross-sex hormones, are just are sterilized. They also have other problems. The cross-sex hormones carry their own risks. Females, the female body, is not supposed to be pumped full of testosterone. It causes problems. And in fact, one particular problem for girls, and some of you may know girls who are identifying as male, and they're saying, I'm going to go on testosterone. It increases your sexual desire, true. It also gives you facial hair. Your voice will drop within the first few months. If you have male pattern baldness in your family, you're going to get bald within usually about six months. But here's the other thing it does. When you give a female testosterone at these high doses, it causes her vagina 
and her endometrial lining to atrophy, to shrink, to shrivel. It causes pain. And so what typically happens with these young girls who've been convinced that somehow their problems will be solved and they'll be happier if they transition to male, they go on the cross-sex hormones and they're going to feel the need to get a hysterectomy. They're gonna feel the need to get a double mastectomy. Why, because even with cross-sex hormones, if you've got breasts, people are gonna read you as a female. So they want to get rid of them. So cross-sex, or so double mastectomies are being done on girls as young as 13, 14, 15. I don't know about you, but I have friends who've gone through breast cancer, who have lost their breasts because of cancer. It is no picnic. It takes a lot of courage to go through that and to find the healing. To put a 13, 14, or 15-year-old through that because she can't bear the thought of growing up to be a woman? What kind of a society does that? Instead of saying, let's ask the question, why? And in fact, again, listening to the testimony of detransitioners, there's a famous one from the UK who actually sued the National Health Service. Her name is Cara Bell, K-E-I-R-A, Cara Bell. And she said she came from a, a dysfunctional family. Uh, she ended up very depressed by the time she was 13, 14, went to the gender clinic. They put her on puberty blockers, then cross-sex hormones. She had a, a double mastectomy at, I think it was 17, 18. And then she hit 20, and she realized as much as she looked in the mirror and tried to see a male, she knew she was still female. And not only that, her body was a wreck. And so she detransitioned. She made the courageous decision to say, I'm done. I'm, I'm getting off these, the testosterone, and I'm going to embrace who I am. And I'm going to figure out what was going on, what was the source of my pain. And what she said was that nobody ever asked why. When she said, I'm a, I'm a boy, you know, I'm, I'm, I know this is who I am, nobody ever asked why. Why is it so terrible? to imagine yourself growing up to be a woman. What's so scary about that? What's the pain driving that desire to flee from who you are? Or as another detransitioner said, um, who had gone through depression, she said, I was trying to kill myself. But this is a different way of killing yourself. I kill off that identity, that person I hated. And I try out this other identity. So this is what we're talking about. This is where gender identity ideology leads. This is the transgender revolution that everyone's cheering about. This is why two biologists with no faith, just looking at things scientifically and medically, say this is harmful to children. Scientists need to stand up to have the courage to speak the truth. So what should we know? One, this is affecting your peers in extreme numbers. You know, and there's a new poll out, which I'll tell you about in a second, but um, there was Gallup data that came out this past year that said about one in six young people between the ages of 18 and 25 identify as LGBTQ. One in six, so about 16%. That's not a natural phenomenon. Okay, throughout history, since we've been measuring it, the number of people who identified in that, those categories was typically one to 3%, and then it inched up to two to 4%. What's going on with your generation? That all of a sudden we have this explosion of people identifying as LGBTQ. Part of it is you've grown up in an era, in a culture that has forgotten that sex has something to do with reproduction, that our bodies reveal something about who we are, that we're designed males and females for one another, that sex is not just about pleasure, it's designed for reproduction. The human person flourishes when we live within the truth of who we are. But when you take a culture that is taught their body is meaningless, that they get to define who they are, they get to decide and go with their feelings, whether it's sexual attractions or identity feelings, 
And it's all up to them. You end up with a very confused and hurting generation. Another number, a, a large study that was done uh, in Pittsburgh over the past, or about six months ago, of high school students found that nearly one in 10 high school students identified as transgender or gender diverse. That, again, is not a natural phenomenon. Until 10 years ago, the statistics clearly showed the average percentage of people who identified as transgender was 0.002. And again, then started inching up. But now, high schoolers, 10%? Part of what's going on there is we have a lot of people suffering from mental health issues. And they're taught in school that if you're feeling bad, if you're feeling pain, well, maybe it's because the authentic you has been buried. Explore your gender. School makes and social media makes the unthinkable. No one in my generation would have ever thought that if you're depressed, maybe the cause is that you're really not the sex that you truly are. It was unthinkable. Well, now it's thinkable. In fact, it's not only thinkable, it's encouraged. So kids are being taught that this is a potential solution. I don't know about you, but when I'm in pain, I want it to go away. If someone proposes a solution, I want to hear it. Kids who are hurting are looking for solutions. And this is what's on offer for them. There was a more recent study that came out done by Barna, which is a very respectable uh, Christian pollster, but the survey sample was a little bit slow, but his, his data showed that your generation was almost a third identifying as LGBTQ. So that, that remains to be seen, but whether it's 16% or, or as many as a third, the point is there's a whole lot of people who don't know who they are, who are searching to understand themselves, who need the truth, and they need people who have the courage to speak the truth. So back to our biologists here. For their trouble, yes, well, it didn't take long for wokeness to exact its price, at least for Colin Wright. Within months of publishing this article in the Wall Street Journal, he found himself reluctantly abandoning his career path as a research biologist. Why? Because students at Penn State complained that the fact that he'd written this article made them feel unsafe to know that he was even on campus. He was doing research in a lab. He had nothing to do with any students. But that was their complaint to the administration. And so when he sought other uh, opportunities as a research scientist, he was told flat out that he was a liability. Or as he said later in, a, in an interview, he was a pariah. People were too willing to just slap a different label on him, the bigot label because he told the truth. In a subsequent interview with the Daily Caller, Wright listed the new taboos of higher education, except at Christendom. He said, it's taboo in academia to publicly state that males and females are real biological categories that have average, innate, physical, and behavioral differences. It's taboo to disagree with the claim that sex is, quote, a spectrum. And it's taboo to entertain the view that psychological differences between human populations may have a genetic component. In other words, we're different. And it's extremely taboo to criticize in any way the doctrine of gender identity. And he's exactly right. I talk to people in, in universities across the country. This is what your peers are drinking like water. And unfortunately, you can go in, and there are lots, lots of good people at, at other schools, etc. The problem is, when you have to go into a place and you have to live a lie, it changes you. In fact, over time, you start to believe the lie. And th that's one of the dangers of a culture that silences disagreement, that silences the truth. So Colin Wright actually had a silver, silver lining to his uh, bailing out from academia. He became an editor for an online journal called Quillette and is doing just terrific work writing and, and things like that. He also started a blog uh, 
on Substack, which he called Reality's Last Stand, which is where this title comes from. And he says in his, in his little About Us part of the Substack, he says, um, he says, the current gender narrative that who we are is defined by a self-declared identity instead of objective biology is the prevailing narrative. And he says, so what if some people are wrong about the nature of biological sex? Does it really matter? And then he answers his own question. He says, in my view, this may be reality's last stand. If this undeniable fact that biological sex is real can be denied en masse, this means we have lost our collective tether to reality and we become hostages to chaos. So, is fighting gender ideology reality's last stand? On a human level, I'd agree with him. I'd agree with him. And it looks pretty bleak when the whole culture, and not just our culture, but the whole developed world is embracing this and it's pushed by the most powerful people you know, on the planet. It hardly seems possible to push back. But what I would say in opposition to that is this. We're Christian, and that's the difference. To someone who does not have faith and who looks at what the world has on offer and what the world is validating as, quote, real and authentic, a lie, it looks pretty bleak. But we know that the author of truth is God himself. There is no reality's last stand because God's not going anywhere, and he's the author of truth. So what we need instead is not to you know, be white knuckle flyers thinking, oh no, it's, you know, it's coming for us, is to step back and say, what do we do? What are we called to do? If we know the truth in a culture that's living by lies, what are we called to do? So I have a couple of suggestions for you, and then I'll, I'll open it for questions. Um, first, pray. Pray. Pray for those who are hurting. I um, am in contact all the time with families whose loved ones are experiencing this. As I said, it is excruciatingly painful. I also listened to a, um, uh, a recording the other day that was made by a young man who had gone through a transition and he had decided to detransition. And so he called his gender therapist and he recorded it and released it. It was one party state where you could do that. And he started just by asking this therapist why she affirmed him in his belief that he was female. And she didn't really have an answer. She said, some people do better, some people are happy, you know? And he said, did you read any of the medical or psychological studies? He said, because I did. I've read 300 of them now. And she said, no. She said, but I went through training. I went through training. Affirmation, that's what we do. And the part that broke my heart was, he said, I was mentally ill and you let me dance in my delusion, and you would not tell me the truth, and now I'm infertile. And he was, it was just the most heartbreaking thing, and she didn't have an answer. And it's not just her, there are uh, just burgeoning numbers of these gender clinics, who many of them think they're doing a good thing, but the truth is sex cannot change. A person who's struggling with identity needs our love. They need our support. They don't need us to walk off the cliff with them. They need us to hold them back and point them in a different direction, to let them know there is hope, there is a better way, there is healing from whatever is underlying all of this. So what do we need to do? Have the courage to speak up, to speak the truth, because where there's silence, that silence is filled by others who are not speaking the truth. And there's plenty of that around, particularly on social media. It is just filling 
you know, the, the social media worlds of our young people down to, to you know, pre-teens and just vile stuff. And pornography plays a role here too as well. So speak up, don't be silent, speak the truth. Learn the language of truth. When you mean sex, biological sex, the difference between male and female, then refer to sex, not gender. We don't own that term. We cannot control its meaning. And right now, the meaning in law and culture is self-defined identity. So don't use gender. There are other words as well. We have some guidance on our website. Respect and love everyone. One of the, one of the real tragedies here is that so many people who struggle with these issues will say, I know what it was like before in a culture that didn't accept and validate this. People were bullied and persecuted. They were harmed. That cannot be how we as Christians live. We need to see the image of Christ in every person, to treat every person with dignity and respect, to let them know the truth, that God loves them. He's got a plan for their life. It can get better than this. We have to be the voice that's saying that. And then finally, um, be there for the long haul. You know, the God, God marks time in ways different than we do. And things that can look bleak in one moment can change overnight. I always think about it as um, looking straight ahead and thinking it's a wall. You get to it and you turn and you realize it was a corner and all of a sudden you see these vistas you didn't see before. God does that all the time. He opens our eyes, he changes hearts, he changes uh, the world we're living in. Open yourself to him to help make that change possible. As Archbishop Gomez said recently, he was talking about woke ideology becoming the new religion. He said, um, we've got a better story to tell. You know, to destroy something, you've got to replace it. To destroy faith, people need a religion. And they think they've found one. So we need to tell the truth, to tell that better story, that God loves and cherishes each person and that we will be glad to introduce anyone to the God we love. Thank you. Question?